Good afternoon, everyone. It's uh, nice to hear you. I, I appreciated your introduction. And for those who have an interest, uh, the Iroquois Nation, if you look at their uh, constitution, you can see where our constitution came from. Uh, and it's always uh, uh, interesting, uh, particularly when I was in Hawaii, and the indigenous people, the native Hawaiians, uh, how they have not been necessarily served well uh, by, uh, by our, uh, our country. I welcome everybody. I'm glad you had something uh, to eat. Uh, we have uh, an hour, I gather, to uh, share some observations uh, with you. Uh, both Kit and I uh, were really very privileged and honored to be able to serve uh, in uh, the administration of Jimmy Carter. Uh, it was a uh, complicated uh, time uh, for us, but I hope in the uh, time we spend together uh, you'll understand why, without any defensiveness, uh, that there is a sense that Jimmy Carter was one of the greatest, if not the greatest, former presidents of the United States, winning the Nobel Prize for Peace, uh, eradicating diseases in Africa, uh, brokering conversations uh, in every part of the world. Uh, we want to try to explain in our thoughts uh, that Jimmy Carter was a great president. Uh, a president whose legislation, both uh, nationally and globally, uh, rivaled that of Lyndon Johnson uh, and surpassed that of Dwight Eisenhower, John Kennedy, Richard Nixon, uh, Jerry Ford, Ronald Reagan, George H.W. Bush, Bill Clinton, George W. Bush, <laughs> and Barack Obama. An extraordinary amount of accomplishments uh, from creating the Secretary of Education, creating the Secretary of Energy, appointing more African Americans and women to the federal judiciary than all the other presidents who preceded him, uh, and was able to burn out the economy of guns and butter that came from uh, Vietnam and was not resolved and left a balanced budget. An extraordinary president who really didn't want to spend a lot of time with the media and didn't want to spend a lot of time in Washington, D.C., in the society, uh, which obviously complicates uh, uh, your life when you don't have any friends who report on you, just as you uh, start to uh, get into a different kind of world today. Uh, a Twitter world, no internet at that time, three anchors, different kind of relationships. Uh, what I want to do is talk just a moment about some things aside from the conversation I'd like to have about the Panama Canal treaties. Kit's going to discuss the Middle East. She's going to discuss uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the recognition and normalization of relations with uh, China. It's things that we uh, had a seat to history, not a participation, but a seat to history of as chiefs of protocol where you become particularly close to the president and first lady, and you are then the guide to the head of state, uh, whether it be a prime minister or a president, uh, when they come to this country or when you go to them uh, on behalf of the president, and they know that you are close to the president and they can say things to you uh, that go around necessarily the channels of the National Security Council or the Department of State. Uh, there are transactional things that occur as a president uh, that you are not anticipating, and then there are strategic things a president accomplishes in international life that they want to accomplish and campaign saying they will try and accomplish. Uh, I don't think Jimmy Carter knew that uh, Stephen Solars, who was a congressman from, from, uh, from Brooklyn, a uh, foreign policy member, uh, would come to him and say, uh, that when he met with uh, President Assad of Syria, if he would ask if 500 Syrian women, uh, Jewish women, uh, could be released and come to the United States because all we were taking were Syrian Jewish men and they had nobody to marry and the women had nobody to marry in Syria. Uh, I don't think he was prepared for that conversation. Uh, we were in England at a G7 meeting and uh, the president took me aside and said, cancel lunch with the queen tomorrow <laughs> uh, and uh, because we're going to go to Geneva to see Assad. 
as Mr. President, you're gonna cancel lunch with the Queen? <laughs> he said, we're gonna go to see Assad about the Middle East. Fine. Uh, the Royal Chief of Protocol, which I thought was a better title than Chief of Protocol, <laughs> uh, said that she will be quite steamed when she hears this. <laughs> and I said, I'm sure she will be. We went to Geneva, and the President said to me before the meeting, table similar to this, this side would be the American delegation, that side would be the Syrian delegation, and there would be translators on both sides. He said, I want to move, I want to sit next to Assad. I said, Mr. President, you know, that's, that's going to be complicated with the State Department. He said, just do it. So I switched it, and the President sat next to Assad, and one of the things he said to him is, these Syrian Jewish women have nobody to marry, these men, can you take care of it? And Assad said, fine, I'll take care of it. He said, I don't like the idea, but I'll take care of it. Uh, that was something I don't think he considered uh, that would happen in foreign policy. But Solars, who was an important player in those years, uh, someone who had actually beaten uh, Schumer for Congress, uh, uh, wanted to have done. Uh, I don't think the president was prepared for the crown of St. Stephen's. Uh, the Pope gave the King of Hungary in the year 1000 a crown to wear. And 50 kings since then, since 1000, uh, wore the crown. Uh, when the Nazis invaded uh, Hungary, uh, the crown disappeared, was found by the United States Army, given to the United States, and we put it in Fort Knox with the gold in Kentucky to preserve it. The Hungarians wanted it back as a symbol of their sovereignty and their independence. Uh, Carter made a decision to give it to him, and Ashley Kitt accompanied Secretary of State Vance when they returned the crown of St. Stephen's, which today sits in the most prominent place in the National Museum of Hungary. It was not only developing relationships with Hungary, it was one more opportunity to take a, uh, to take a situation uh, that was against the tenants of the Soviet Union, remembering in those years that was a binary kind of situation in foreign policy, which today is anything but that. I don't think he was prepared for Idi Amin, who he criticized continually as the president of Uganda uh, for human rights violations, when uh, Idi Amin took a hundred Christian missionaries and said he would start to kill one a day until the president apologized for those kinds of uh, comments that he had made. Carter decided the way to resolve it was to call the king of Saudi Arabia, so you understand how this world works, who basically was writing the checks to support Uganda and had the king of Saudi Arabia as a favor of call Idi Amin and told him to release him, which he did. Idi Amin, if you remember, interestingly, was also the person who received, uh, when the PLO uh, hijacked an Israeli airplane uh, that was on its way to Paris and pe took it through the first time I ever heard the term Benghazi, and then they ended up in, uh, in uh, Uganda, uh, and the leader of the raid to save the 125 or so Jewish uh, people who were on that flight, uh, it was an Air France flight, and released the other 125, uh, the leader of that, uh, raid, and the only person killed uh, was Benjamin Netanyahu's brother, uh, which began to make Netanyahu a formidable name in Israeli politics because of the death of his brother. I don't think the president was prepared for Cuba when he basically had every effort uh, through Andy Young, who is his congressman from Atlanta, uh, the chief lieutenant for Martin Luther King, uh, be able to start negotiations with Cuba, that are able to release 3,500 prisoners, start to allow Americans to travel for certain business purposes to Cuba, when uh, the Port of Marigo uh, became a site that was very complicated for the United States because we always welcomed refugees from Cuba. What we uh, weren't prepared for I don't think anybody was prepared for, is 10,000 Cubans went through the Peruvian embassy and stayed on their grounds demanding they be released. Uh, our policy was to ask for them to be released, and they came to America, primarily Miami, uh, 
where the Cubans were welcomed. But by the time it built up, 125,000 Cubans on 1,700 boats left that port and went to Miami, overloading Miami. And so the president decided where could he send them other than Georgia, his home state, and decided the best place to send them was the most democratic uh, political state in the country in those years, none other than Arkansas. <laughs> he sent him to Fort Chaffee, Arkansas, which, re which resulted in Bill Clinton losing for his third term as governor of Arkansas to Frank White. He then came back and beat White in 1982, but the problems that that caused caused a breach in the relationship between Clinton and, uh, and uh, Carter and resulted in three of the senior staff from the 19. Uh, 76 and 1980 campaigns trying to help Ross Perot in 1992 rather than Bill Clinton. And as you may remember or not remember, uh, Ross Perot got 19% of the vote. Bill Clinton did not get 50% of the vote. But in those years, the Electoral College worked for him, for the <laughs> Democrats, and he was elected uh, president of uh, the United States. I don't think the president uh, assumed uh, that uh, his support, as historically had it been for the Shah of Iran, would result in uh, the Ayatollah Khomeini returning from Paris, uh, have students go into the embassy not to take it over, uh, but to make a demonstration that they wanted the Shah removed. I had been in Tehran. I had seen uh, the, uh, uh, the silence that met uh, the Shah, the silence that met the president was not surprised uh, when Khomeini came back, wasn't surprised with the over, uh, with the, uh, with the uh, uh, Khomeini being able to stir the crowds. But what I was surprised by was when the Shah had to leave and then the president, as a humanitarian gesture, because of his cancer that he had, allowed him to be able to go to Cornell Weill Medical Center in New York, which caused those students to be endorsed by Khomeini and they took over and held hostage 52 Americans. They were not innocent Americans walking down the street. They were mostly military, they were mostly CIA, uh, they were mostly volunteers. Carter did not make a decision other than to focus on the 52 hostages and how to get them back safely, refused the political uh, problems that that caused of America always wanting to strike back, never liking to be feel, feel that they had a situation, and then a Syracuse alum, Ted Koppel, <laughs> decided to start a television show. Every night at 11.30, America held hostage. Day one, day 10, day 100, day 300. The hostages were taken exactly one year from the election in 1980. One year from the election in 1980. So you understand how policy works. There is a gentleman by the name of Gary Sick, S-I-C-K, who was on the National Security Council. He wrote a wonderful book that has some kinds of remnants of what we listen to today, that William Casey, later the head of the CIA, met secretly with the Iranians in Paris and said that we will make a better deal if you keep the hostages and Reagan becomes president on all the kinds of sanctions that are against you. That book is well researched and well footnoted, but no one went there. Uh, and the hostages, as you may remember, were released on the very moment that Ronald Reagan was being sworn in as his inauguration in 1981. And I would add, for all of you from different countries at one point, for America, after 12 years of Franklin Roosevelt, in eight years, of, seven years of Harry Truman, and eight years of Dwight Eisenhower, Ronald Reagan was our seventh president in 21 years. Our seventh president in 21 years for America, the great power, having almost a destabilizing kind of politics. Uh, those things, I don't think uh, the president uh, really considered. He did consider the salt talks, strategic, uh, uh, limitation, nuclear weapons, 
uh, started by President Ford in 1974, uh, consummated by Carter in 1978. Kid, I think you went to Vienna mm -hmm. for the signing with Brezhnev and Carter. Uh, a lot of complications because uh, I can't remember if Brezhnev kissed Carter or Carter kissed Brezhnev, <laughs> but that was the story. Mm -hmm. That was the story. Uh, but then, uh, again, in politics, the Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan. Everybody was furious. And so, as retribution, again, a political nightmare for many of us. And you may realize I was later treasurer of the Democratic Party and chairman of the 1980 campaign. <laughs> the, uh, the president refused to allow American Olympians to participate in the 1980 Olympics which was in Moscow, where, where uh, 65 countries joined us to deny uh, Russia, uh, the USSR in those years, the opportunity for public relations. So those are the kinds of things you don't think are going to happen. And they happen transactionally. They come in over the transom, if you will. And you have to be prepared at all times. And you have to have talented people who understand that Jimmy Carter was about one thing, human rights. He created an assistant secretary of state for human rights, and that was his issue with every country, and he never hesitated to call out a country, never hesitated to call out his own country, on Native Americans, on people who were minorities, people who had been uh, in underdeveloped areas and where your zip code basically meant where your life was gonna spend. Let's talk about the Panama Canal treaties. Uh, James Monroe, 1823, uh, set up a policy, the Monroe Doctrine, basically said this about America. Here's the deal. You guys want to fight each other in Europe? Go ahead. Italy wants to attack Spain. France wants to attack Germany. Good luck. We're not getting involved. And we're not going to get involved in your colonies either. In South, Central, Latin America, the Caribbean, you have colonies. They want to fight each other. Great. However, if you try to get involved in any other of those countries, we will consider it a direct attack on the United States. 1823. In the mid-1860s, maybe 1866, 67, Ulysses S. Grant, an underrated president of the United States, said, you know, we really ought to look at that Isthmus of Panama, of Panama, of Panama uh, and try to join the Pacific and the Atlantic Oceans together for trade. Something that Balboa said in 1513 when he went to find the Pacific Ocean, which is interesting that my brother, late brother, Marty's father, uh, went on that trail uh, when he was a member of the Explorers Club trying to find out where, where Balboa was buried. But all these years, they've been trying to figure out how to make that easier. Uh, the French tried it in the 1880s. Ferdinand de Lesseps, a great canal pioneer, uh, failed because of money, lack of money resources, and because of a disease, yellow fever particularly. Then we decided for a country who's very upset about Russia and legitimately, but I think you realize that we've been involved in other countries. <laughs> uh, Colombia was where the Panama Canal Isthmus was. Uh, in 1903, uh, Colombia, which had been divided for many years between the Federalists, which are liberals, and the conservatives, uh, decided that they maybe should have a Panama Canal. And, uh, and they made a, uh, a, made a deal with uh, the French. But it was a bad deal for the Senate of Colombia to ratify because they felt that it gave too much away. So Teddy Roosevelt, who wasn't big on process, <laughs> who was president of the United States, decided to send down the USS Nashville, send down the army to stop the trains in Colombia from going to the part of Colombia called Panama, and uh, a, a fellow uh, who was an investor, a French investor in a canal company that would be successful financially for him if a canal was built, had the Panamanian rebels secede from Colombia recognize them as an independent country, <laughs> recognize them as an independent country, and signed a deal that gave the United States the Panama Canal when it was constructed in perpetuity. 
forever. The ability to control access, primarily access to the canal, and the way to defend it. Well, it wasn't something that the Panamanians uh, uh, liked the idea of giving it away, especially when we took our revenue in gold and paid our employees in silver. But if you have been to Panama or go to Panama, you'll see the old parts of it. You will see that there was a division in the middle on the sides of the Panama Canal. One side was Panama City, uh, older, gray, poverty, disease, and the Panama Canal Zone, which looked like Westchester County. Mm -hmm. It was green and no Spanish was allowed to be spoken and the United States flag flew. That went on for a while, and in, in they tried, uh, Dwight I, Lyndon Johnson said he would try to resolve it and upgrade the, uh, the canal, uh, Jerry Ford, Richard Nixon, but 38 senators in 1974 uh, passed a resolution that the canal could never be uh, uh, changed, the canal treaties could never be changed. Uh, you need 68 votes, you need two-thirds of the Senate to con firm a treaty in the United States. Well, in 1964, some high school students in Panama decided they wanted to raise the Panamanian flag. Well, what resulted is something that was very, very underreported, is there was a big fight that broke out. 20 Panamanians were killed, four Americans were killed. Johnson got involved, but nothing really happened until Carter came in and something that he wanted to do. He wanted to bring peace in the Middle East. He wanted to normalize relations with China. And he wanted to resolve the Panama Canal because he knew the rebels there that were very upset with the military hunters. And I want, I want to make sure that you understand. I want to make sure that I tell you what the situation was in 1977 when Jimmy Carter became president. Cuba, Argentina, Bolivia, Brazil, Chile, Ecuador, El Salvador, Guatemala, Haiti, Honduras, Nicaragua, Paraguay, Peru, Uruguay, and Panama were all run by military hunters. All of them. All those countries. Ten years later, they were all democracies. But they weren't then. And so Jimmy Carter started the negotiations by naming two prominent Americans as negotiators. One was Ellsworth Bunker, who came from a, a patrician wealthy sugar family, who had been ambassador to India and Nepal, he had been ambassador to Italy, he had been ambassador to Argentina, he had been ambassador to Viet, South Vietnam, he was the Paris Peace Talks, and he was joined by somebody who went to school down the road here in Cornell, Sal Linowitz, who went to school uh, just as his father went bankrupt. Uh, and through various jobs and, and uh, scholarships, graduated from Cornell, went number one in his class at Cornell Law School, joined a fledgling company that ultimately became Xerox, and he was a very liberal Democrat who cared about poverty and cared about Latin America, and Bunker and Linowitz went to work on the politics of ending uh, the imperpetuity of the United States uh, running the Panama Canal. Joined, however, politically, were Hamilton Jordan, the late chief of staff to President Carter, young man, a little older than I was. We were all probably a little too young to have those positions of power. Not young in, in any other way than inexperienced. Uh, you get experience quickly. Uh, and uh, Gabriel Lewis, who was a businessman and a friend of General Torrijos, not the president of Panama, but he ran Panama. And I remember when I went down on an advanced trip with a fellow named Phil Wise, uh, who is still working with the Carter Center as chief of operations, uh, no one would talk to us. We kept on talking to our ambassadors saying, we need to speak with the Panamanians about getting people together. And we got a call at 11 o'clock at night to come over and meet somebody named Manuel Noriega, <laughs> who later became the dictator of uh, Panama, later went to prison, for drug trafficking since passed away, as has Torrios. And then he started to make things happen. But it really was aside from Bunker, and aside from Linowitz, and aside from the normal channels, it wasn't that Vance, it wasn't that Brzezinski, it wasn't that anybody who was the national security advisor, Zbigniew Brzezinski, uh, 
whose daughter actually is uh, on Morning Joe, married to Joe. Uh, uh, that, that relationship was important. It was also important, interestingly, is that Torrios' wife was Jewish. The Panamanian people, for 400 years, the Jewish community had grown to be a significant community. Israel also had the need for the Panama Canal to work. That was their way to shortcut through to Asia. It was also the way for Egypt of countries to provide oil to Japan, which obviously doesn't have any natural resources like that. So the Panama Canal, all you have to do in that 10 mile wide, uh, 50 mile long isthmus is sink one or two ships and the Panama Canal's closed. That's all you have to do. A little dynamite takes care of everything. And Carter was concerned, deeply concerned, uh, that we needed to make a decision. So we did. And the political people then started 1,500 town hall meetings. Because I remember when Pacadell, who just died, who was the chief pollster to Jimmy Carter, came in and said, you know, Mr. President, here's the deal. 78% of the people in America don't want to give away the Panama Canal. 8% think this is a good idea. Ronald Reagan, President of the United States, didn't win the first time, didn't win three times, didn't win in 1968, but ran and lost in 1976 to a sitting president, Jerry Ford, who was a successor to Richard Nixon when Nixon resigned. Well, he said during his campaign against Ford, we built it, we paid for it, we own it, and we're keeping it. And we're not gonna give it to a tin horn dictator from Panama. When we took that poll, it said that 45% didn't wanna give away something we bought and paid for, and another 25% said we're not gonna kowtow to any dictator in Panama. The reality was we had to change the conversation and talk about the reality of South America, Central America, Latin America, and eventually it got to be 42 to 45 in favor of the Panama Canal treaties, and still you had to do what we call retail politics. You had to get 68 votes, and we had about 59. So President Carter enlisted the help of Richard Nixon, he enlisted the help of Jerry Ford, of Henry Kissinger, Howard Baker particularly, the minority leader of the Senate, Republicans, and they finally got to 68 by Carter having to deal with one-on-one -on -one conversations. There was a fellow named S.I. Hayakawa, former president of San Francisco State University, senator from California, wrote a book on semantics, insisted that Carter read his book on semantics. <laughs> if you know Jimmy Carter, read the book <laughs> in one night, had him in, discussed the entire book with, with Hayakawa, and Hayakawa conceded that he would now vote for the Panama Canal treaties. Mark Hatfield, Republican senator from, from Oregon, was up against re-election, and he was feeling threatened by a fellow named Mike Mansfield, former majority leader of the Senate, who Carter appointed an ambassador to Japan, was supporting his opponent. Carter called Mansfield, asked him to call off the going after of Hatfield. Hatfield voted for it. It was water deals in Oklahoma. It was all kinds of conversations to finally get to the end where uh, the American Jewish community uh, went to Howard Cannon, the senator from Nevada, and said, look, this is important for Israel, this is important for our country, and Howard Cannon became the 68th vote to do what we should have done easily. We should have done it easily. It was not a complicated issue. No one really substantively disagreed with it. But a lot of people didn't like the idea, and at the end of the day, when we lost to Ronald Reagan, and foreign policy goes, on the Friday before the Tuesday, Saturday being the one year anniversary of Ted Koppel saying 352 days, 358 days, half an hour show, Pat Cadell told us that since polling really began in 1948, 
if you went into the final weekend undecided, it would usually go two to one to the incumbent. They'd rather stay with who they know than go against them. He told us on Monday night that they broke nine to one against Jimmy Carter on that one issue. It wasn't the Iranian hostages taking and our reaction to it when we try to resolve it with the military helicopters where one crashed and they couldn't continue with the mission. It was the feeling of a loss that somehow America was taken down uh, with their image uh, around the world. And we lost uh, in, that, uh, in that last weekend. So anything you do internationally has ramifications in this country politically. And uh, uh, the, the result is that Jimmy Carter stood hard for human rights, was a significant president in domestic congressional relations, with people that he didn't know and people who thought he was from the wrong region, the wrong religion. They didn't like his voice. They didn't like him on television. Uh, the reality was he was not a glad hander. He was not a backslapper. He was a serious political figure. And now I want to introduce Kip, who's going to talk to you uh, a little bit about uh, Camp David in the Middle East and, uh, and uh, have a little conversation about the normalization of relations with China, neither of one, neither one of which was a particularly popular situation. And so let me conclude by saying the difficulty working for Jimmy Carter and then later in politics was Jimmy Carter did everything you would do in a second term and you would never touch in a first term. Jimmy Carter decided <laughs> to do everything in his first term and it ended up that he was a very popular former president. <laughs> Kit. <laughs> thank, thank you. Um, as, as you can um, see, um, being chief of protocol was a very, was an um, incredible front row seat on history during the, the time that, uh, that we had the honor to serve, and it has um, made, enriched our lives in so many ways um, over the years. Um, it was after the passage of the Panama Canal Treaties and um, their ratification uh, in the Senate and the signing, uh, which was a ceremony in, in uh, Washington that Evan could actually speak for a very long time. It was kind of an, that was a, uh, an amazing event. But um, President Carter asked Evan to be treasurer of the Democratic National Committee and then asked me to serve as chief of protocol. Uh, President, Mrs. Carter, and Evan all encouraged my active role during the time that I was the wife of the chief of protocol. I was involved with all the official visits, it went on the presidential trips abroad. Evan had named me as gift officer. And then I advanced and, at, and, and traveled um, at Rosalind Carter's request when she um, went to seven countries in Latin America in May of 1977. My first trip, as officially as chief of protocol, was to Panama uh, with President Carter when we went to visit the canal. And it was um, pretty incredible to see um, you know, how, how, uh, how dangerous a situation it was, how, how small the canal is, and, and how easy it would have been for any kind of terrorist act to, to, uh, to close down the canal. So um, it was, you know, there was no question that what President Carter did was was the, um, the the critical thing to do, but but he took it on regardless of of the effect on his own personal political situation. Um, during the years that that Evan and I served, um, I traveled to more than thirty different countries, and we oversaw more than sixty visits of heads of state and heads of government to, to Washington, and and some who traveled in the country. Some particularly important foreign policy initiatives were during my service. As with the Panama Canal Treaties, they have remained of great transformational consequence after the passage of 40 years. Um, the Camp David peace process resulted in the signing of a treaty between Israel and Egypt, which while often a cool peace, has nonetheless led to no war, where there had been wars in both 1968 and 73. President Carter is an engineer by training and by natural style. He studies all aspects of an issue in great detail. 
He's also a natural mediator, coming, coming to understand both sides' point of view. In this case of Middle East peace, he memorized the complex land issues and history of the region so basic to the dispute. He also studied carefully and got to know personally both President Sadat and Prime Minister Begin. Uh, actually, Prime Minister Rabin was in office when, when the Carter administration began, but he unexpectedly lost an election in June of 1977 to Menachem Begin who was um, from the first uh, elected from the Bukid party and um, was unknown. He had never served in, um, in, in the uh, government of Israel before, so it was a process to learn, suddenly to learn a great deal about him. Uh, both Prime Minister Begin and President Sadat of Egypt became very frequent visitors. And as chief of protocol, it was my responsibility to meet them on arrival and escort them to their schedule of meetings. When they both accepted President Carter's invitation to Camp David for September of 1978, we began the process of arrangements there, and I spent the 13 days during the meetings. No time frame had been set for the meetings. It was enormously courageous of President Carter to agree to stay as long as it took to hopefully find agreement. All outside communication was very limited. Camp David has phones, but they're connected to the White House. Security around the facility is very tight, and much to their dismay, the press were kept to an outside area where they got briefings from the White House press secretary. Each side had a delegation, including the foreign minister, defense minister, a legal advisor, the ambassador to Washington, and other top aides. In making the arrangements, we assumed that with three nations involved, we needed a round table for negotiations. There was none at Camp David. We ended up putting a round top on a billiard table with a cloth, and during the 13 days, the three delegations actually never met together. It, the table was used um, for the individual delegation meetings. For the first three days, President Carter met with President Sadat and Prime Minister Begin together. But they argued with each other with so much anger that President Carter began meeting with them individually, going over details of a peace proposal that had been developed line by line. After meeting with one, he took the results to the other. Tensions were great with disagreements from various members of the delegations, some of whom wanted to end the process. After a week, President Carter took the delegations to Gettysburg. Military trained members of all three delegations had studied this battle. So that it was, they, they had something in, in common to, to be part of a military uh, field. President Carter wanted to remind all of them the alternative to finding peace. A very emotional moment was when we arrived at the spot where President Lincoln had given the address, and Prime Minister Begin recited the address. And um, it was, um, Prime Minister Begin was someone who didn't show a lot of emotion, and it was, um, it was, it was, it was quite a moment. Discussions continued during the second week with progress, and then eventually only a few issues in dispute. But on that Sunday, Prime Minister Begin said that he could not accept any the final details and that he must leave. President Carter, thinking that it was over without success, went to his office at Camp, da at the, and, at Camp David, and he saw photos on his desk of the three leaders that were signed by all. We all got copies of this picture that of the three of them standing in front of Aspen Lodge, the president's um, facility there, and, and they had all, all three signed the photographs. Prime Minister Begin had requested copies for his eight grandchildren, and President Carter's secretary had asked the Israeli embassy for their names, and each photo was inscribed personally. President Carter took the photos to Prime Minister Begin, who on 
seeing the names on the photos became very emotional. He was going to have to go home and tell these children <laughs> that he had not been successful. And he then said that he would continue the conversation. And with more tense discussion, they came to an agreement. And that afternoon, they came, we came back to the White House and had a ceremony announcing that, that they had come to an agreement after this period of time. This was a critical beginning to the final treaty. Prime Minister Begin and President Sadat visited DC more times, and President Carter went to Israel and Egypt with many difficult moments when all could be lost. Finally, the treaty was signed on the White House lawn in March of 1979. Israel traded land for peace with Egypt, which was the mili major military force in the wa wars they had fought. It was not the broader agreement that President Carter sought. He had met with President Assad of Syria and King Hussein of Jordan, neither of whom had agreed to participate. But President Carter's detailed study, courage to stick his neck out, and great patience had remarkably paid off. Um, the visit of Deng Xiaoping was a very different accomplishment. President Nixon rightly gets much credit for opening the door with China. However, it was President Carter who made full diplomatic relations possible. The Shanghai communique of Nixon's time acknowledged that there was only one China, but our historic diplomatic ties with Taiwan remained, and President Nixon and Ford were not willing to attack tackle this issue, particularly in their first terms, and then neither of them had a second term. When Deng Xiaoping came to power in December of 1978, the time was right to move forward, but he would only agree to full relations if we severed official relations with Taiwan. President Carter understood that under our Constitution, the president has the sole authority for diplomatic recognition and he was determined to use it <clears throat> if adequate agreement could be reached regarding treatment of the people of Taiwan. President Carter was successful in the negotiations which have been maintained between China uh, that without, um, um, we, we, without any attack on, on Taiwan during this period of time. So that has, that has been successful for all. Um, as Chief of Protocol, it was my responsibility to meet Deng when he landed on U.S. soil in an Air Force base in Alaska, and I returned to Washington on his plane. We had the official visit in Washington, and then I traveled with him to Atlanta and Houston. At all stop stops, he was treated like a rock star. It um, was, was really wonderful to see that the American people um, there had been concern that this would be a controversial move to recognize, to recognize the People's Republic of China, but it turned out to be hugely successful. And um, much of it was, um, it was very much helped by Deng Xiaoping, who um, was very comfortable with this role of, of as I say, of being rock star. Um, one of, when we went to Houston, he, um, he they had a... Um, a rodeo, and there was much discussion. They wanted to give him a 10-gallon ga hat, which we had to make sure we got the right measurements so that it was the right size. And, and um, so as we were driving to the, to the rodeo, I explained to him that they, he was going to be presented with a 10-gallon hat, and, he, and, and they also, at the intermission for the rodeo, they were going to offer him the opportunity to ride in a stagecoach, which, you know, this was his choice, but this was, this was what was available. And I think that he must have watched some Western movies <laughs> because he accepted the hat, he put it on, he, he smiled, he walked out and got on the stagecoach and they drove around and he waved the hat out of, <laughs> out of the stagecoach and it, it kind of melted everyone's feeling that they were, the feeling was this is somebody that we can, that we, that we can um, be excited about having relations with. It was, um, uh, it, it was, it was a wonderful moment. Um, 
after so many years of no relationship with, with China, um, Deng and President Carter had extensive talks and signed several major agreements. One established nonstop airline flights from San Francisco to Shanghai. And after President Carter had left office, Evan and I were invited by the Chinese to be part of the delegation for that inaugural flight of their airline in February of 1981. Now having visited China many times since, it was of great interest to have been to Shanghai and Beijing during that time before Western hotels and, where, and when almost everyone was, was still riding bicycles. Um, the extraordinarily ongoing results from the establishment of full diplomatic relations and the opening of economic exchange with China is not debatable. In this case, President Carter had the great good fortune to work with Jiang Xiaoping. The timing of Soviet leadership was not as favorable. As Evan mentioned, I accompanied President Carter to Vienna in June of 1979 to meet with Brezhnev, who was not well enough to travel to Washington. Um, when we went for the advance trip to Vienna, my biggest memory of, of the discussion sitting around a table like this with the Soviets was in every discussion about um, something that would be public, they would literally count the steps that Brezhnev would have to take in public. His, his condition was so, he, he really, walking was, was, was a real complication for him. And, and um, the, Evan mentioned about the, about the kiss when they were setting up the table for their signing ceremony for the SALT II, um, making the arrangements. It, it seemed very odd, but um, the Soviets kept, they, they kept moving the chairs together for Brezhnev and Carter, and we kept pushing them apart <laughs> because we didn't. He, uh, Brezhnev is a very, was a very large person, and <laughs> President Carter is small in stature. So it, 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 having the chairs so to, close together didn't make a lot of sense. But after they made the signing and they stood up and they shook hands, Brezhnev reached out and hugged Carter and actually kissed him on each cheek. And, and, and it being so much larger, he just sort of engulfed him like a bear. And um, it, was, it was a picture that, that was, we didn't anticipate. We had, we, I mean, we, we tried to keep the chairs apart, <laughs> but we didn't really understand. Obviously, it was a planned thing. And, and it was a picture that, that was, was very detrimental to President Carter because it looked like he was being engulfed by, by, by the Soviet leader, um, who actually was not in a physical condition to, to um, you know, to, to, to actually even to, to do negotiations or to or, or to to um, walk around, so um, the SALT II agreement was concluded, but there was there wasn't an opportunity for a real relationship. Although SALT II was not ratified by the Senate because of the um, uh, concern about the invasion, the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, it did remain in effect, um, be actually beyond the five years that were projected. It was. It, um, and then later in the 1980s, um, timing gave President Reagan Gorbachev to work with. And I've often wondered how different the view <clears throat> of what President Carter would be if he had had the opportunity to work with that leader, as well as a second term to deal with the Middle East and time to cement his comprehensive energy policy, which um, included at the time panels that he put on the roof of the White House which were later removed by, by President Reagan. Um, as, as you can see, we um, had um, extraordinary opportunities to uh, participate in, um, in, in, these, in these various um, foreign policy um, events of, of, of that era. And um, I hope that many of you will go into government service and find the opportunity to work in an administration that after 40 years, it can be said, there are multiple examples of positive transformational change that have endured. Um, as Evan said, many refer to the outstanding work of President Carter and since he was, he was um, president, but he, he was not a communicator in a TV age but as a human being who deeply cares about human rights, making substantial progress, and someone willing to do the hard work and have the courage to follow through 
even when the outcome is not assured, and the intelligence to understand complex issues, and the patience to take the time necessary. Any of these efforts require a strong team, but the leader is essential. As Vice President Mondale said, we told the truth, we obeyed the law, we kept the peace. So, uh, Evan, I'd be very happy to answer any questions that you might have. Sure. <laughs> yeah, do you have questions? I, we're happy to try to uh, respond to them, if you wish, or comments. It's always hard. I've taught for a long time, <laughs> and food, I, I know you came here to see us, and, <laughs> and lunch helps, but do you have any questions? Uh, does anybody have anything you want to say that disagrees with anything we said, or you think everybody in the room wouldn't agree with you? Mm -hmm. I'll tell you one thing that I, I learned in the Panama Canal Treaties. There was a great senator from Louisiana named Russell Wong. If you know about American politics, you know the Long family in Louisiana is very powerful. Huey Long was a famous uh, governor, and his brother Earl uh, was a famous governor. And it really goes to relationships in domestic or global politics. Uh, he was uh, elected uh, to serve after uh, uh, Huey. And one day, a uh, young Republican legislator was called into his office. And uh, Governor Long said, son, I need your vote today. And the young legislator said, Governor, when you're right, you're right, I'm with you. And when you're wrong, I just can't be with you. And on this issue, I think you're wrong. And old Earl leaned across his desk and said, son, when I'm right, I don't need you. <laughs> <laughs> a lot to do with American politics, and it's a lot to do with the global politics. Mm -hmm. Any thoughts?